Thrawn Janet. The Reverend Murdoch Sulis was long minister of the Moorland parish of Balwiri in the Vale of Dule. A severe, bleak-faced old man, dreadful to his hearers, he dwelt in the last years of his life without relative or servant or any human company in a small and lonely manse under the hanging shaw. In spite of the iron composure of his features, his eye was wild, scared and uncertain, and when he dwelt in private admonitions on the future of the impenitent, it seemed as if his eye pierced through the storms of time to the terrors of eternity. Many young persons coming to prepare themselves against the season of the Holy Communion were dreadfully affected by his talk. He had a sermon on the devil as a roaring lion on the Sunday after every 17th of August, and he was accustomed to surpass himself upon that text, both by the appalling nature of the matter and the terror of his bearing in the pulpit. The children were frightened into fits, and the old looked more than usually oracular, and were all that day full of those hints that Hamlet deprecated. The manse itself, where it stood by the water of Duel among some thick trees, with the shaw overhanging it on the one side, and on the other many cold moorish hilltops rising toward the sky, had begun, at a very early period of Mr. Sewis's ministry, to be avoided in the dusk hours by all who valued themselves upon their prudence, and good men sitting at the Clacken alehouse shook their heads together at the thought of passing late by that uncanny neighbourhood. There was one spot, to be more particular, which was regarded with especial awe. The man stood between the high road and the water of Dio, with a gable to each, its bank was toward the Kirk town of Balwiri, nearly half a mile away. In front of it, a bare garden, hedged with thorn, occupied the land between the river and the road. The house was two storeys high, with two large rooms in each. It opened not directly in the garden, but on a causeway path or passage, giving in the road on the one hand, and closed on the other by the tall willows and elders that bordered on the stream. And it was this strip of causeway that enjoyed among the young parishioners of Balwiri so infamous a reputation. The minister walked there often after dark, sometimes groaning aloud in the instancy of his unspoken prayers. And when he was from home and the man's store was locked, the more daring schoolboys ventured with beating hearts to follow my leader across that legendary spot. This atmosphere of terror surrounding, as it did, a man of God of spotless character and orthodoxy was a common cause of wonder and subject of inquiry among the few strangers who were led by chance or business into that unknown, outlying country. But many even of the people of the parish were ignorant of the strange events which had marked the first year of Mr. Sowes's ministrations. And among those who were better informed, some were naturally reticent, and others shy of that particular topic. Now and again, only, one of the older folk would warm into courage over his third tumbler and recount the cause of the minister's strange looks and solitary life. Fifty years sign when Mr. Sewers came first into Bawiri, he was still a young man, a callant, the folk said, full book learning and grand at the exposition, but, as was natural in so young a man, we nae leave an experience in religion. The younger sort were greatly taken with his gifts and his gab, but all concerned serious men and women were moved even to prayer for the young man, whom they took to be a self-deceiver, and the parish that was like to be so ill-supplied. It was before the days of the moderates, weary for them, but ill things are like good. They both come bit by bit, a pickle at a time. And there were folk even then that said the Lord had left the college professors to their own devices, and the lads that went to study with them, what he done mere and better sitting in a peat bog, like their forebears of the persecution, with a Bible under their oakster, and a spiritual prayer in their heart. There was no doubt only why, but that Mr. Sewis had been our lang at the college. He was careful and troubled for many things beside the all thing needful. He had a feckle books with him, mere than had ever been seen before in all the presbytery, and a sair work the carrier had with him. 
for they were all like to have smeared in the deal's hag between this and Cal McCurley. They were books of divinity, to be sure, or so they called them. But the serious were all opinion that was little service for Simone when the halo god's word would gang in the nuke of a plaid. Then he would sit half the day and half the nicht for by, which was scant decent writing, nay less, and first they were feared he would read his sermons, and shine it would prove he was writing a book himself, which was surely no fitting for any of his years and small experience. Only anyway, white. It behooved him to get an old decent wife to keep the mans for him and to see his bit dinners and he was recommended to an old limmer, Janet McClure they called her, and so far left to himself as to be our persuaded. There was money advised him to the contra, for Janet was more than suspected by the best folk in Bawiri. Lang or that, she had had a way into a dragoon. She hadn't come for it for maybe... Thirty year, and Bairns had seen her mumbling to herself, up in keys lone in the gloaming, whilk was an unco time and place for a God-fearing woman. Howsoever, it was the laird himself that had first told the minister of Janet, and in they days he would have gone far to get the pleasure of the laird. When folk told him that Janet was sib to the deal, it was a superstition by his way of it, and when they cast up the Bible to him and the witch of Endor, he would threep it down the thrapples that their days were again by and the deal was mercifully restrained. Well, when it got about the clacking that Janet McClure was to be servant at the manse, the folk were fair mad with her and him together, and some of the goodwives had nae better today than get round her door cheeks and charge away all that was kent again her, for the soldiers bairn to John Thompson's twokai. She was no great speaker. Folk usually let her gang at her own gate, and she let them gang theirs, with neither fair gidden nor fair good day, but when she buckled to, she had a tongue to deave the miller. Up she got, and there wasn't an old story in Bawiri, but she got somebody loup it for that day. They couldn't say anything, but she could say twat it, till, at the hinder end, the gidwives up and clawed hondo her and clawed the coats off her back and put her down the clack into the water of deal to see if she were a witch or no, soom or droon. The carlin skirled till you could hear her at the hanging shaw and she fought like ten. There was money a gidwife bore the mark of her nearest day and money a long day after, and just in the hettest of the collie shangy, was had come up for his sins but the new minister. Women, said he, and he had a grand voice, I charge you in the Lord's name to let her go. Janet ran to him. She was fair wood with terror and clung to him and prayed him for Christ's sake, save her for the comers, and they, for their part, told them that all was Kent and maybe mere. Women, says he to Janet, is this true? As the Lord sees me, says she, as the Lord made me, no a word to it, for by the bairn, says she, I've been a decent woman all my days. Will you, says Mr. Sowas, in the name of God and before me, his unworthy minister, renounce the devil and his works? Well, it would appear that when he asked it that, she gave a gun that fairly fricked at them, and they could hear her teeth play dull together in her chafts, but there was nothing for it, but the eyeway or the other, and Janet lifted up her hand and renounced the deal before them all. And now, says Mr. Sowers to the goodwives, home with ye, one and all, and pray to God for his forgiveness. And he gave Janet his arm, though she had little honour but a sark, and took her up the clacking to her ain door like a lady of the land, and her screeching and laughing as was a scandal to be heard. There were mony grey folk lang out their prayers that night, but when the morn came, there was sich a fear fell upon a Bawiri that the bairns hid their cells, and even the men folk stood and kick it frae their doors. For there was Janet coming down the clacking, her or her likeness, nane could tell, with her neck thrown and her head on a side like a body that has been hanged, and a gun on her face like an unstreaked corp. By and by they got used with it, 
and even speared at her to ken what was wrong. But for that day forth, she couldn't speak like a Christian woman, but slavered and played click with her teeth like a pair of shears. And for that day forth, the name of God came never on her lips. While she would try to say it, but it might not be. Them that Kent best said least, but they never gave that thing the name of Janet McClure, for the old Janet, by their way of it, was in muckle hell that day. But the minister was neither to hod nor to bind. He preached about nothing but the folk's cruelty that had gained her a stroke of the palsy. He scalped the bairns that meddled her, and he had her up to the manse that same nicht, and while there he is laying with her under the hanging shaw. Well, time gied by, and the idler sort commenced to think mere lichtly o' that black business. The minister was weel thought though. He was aye late at the writing. Folk would see his cannel doon by the dual water after twelve at e'en, and he seemed pleased with himself, and up sitting as at first, though nobody could see that he was dwining. As for Janet, she came and she guide. If she didn't speak muckle afore, it was reason she should speak less then she meddled nabdy. But she was an eldritch thing to see, and nane would have mistrusted her with her baweary glebe. About the end of July there came a spell of weather, the like o' it was never seen in that countryside. It was lowing and het and hitless. The herds couldn't win up the black hill. The bairns were ower weary to play, and yet it was goosty too, with claps o' het one that rummled in the glens, and bits o' shoers that slockened Nathan. Why thought it but to thunder in the morn? But the morn came, and the morn's morning. And it was I the same uncanny weather, Saron folks and bestial. Of all that were the war, Nain suffered like Mr. Sulis. He could neither sleep nor eat. He told his elders, and when he wasn't writing at his weary book, he would be stravaging over all the countryside like a man possessed, when nobody else was blithe to keep collar being the house. A boon hanging shaw in the build of the black hill. There's a bit enclosed grand with an iron yurt, and it seems in the old days that was the kirk yard of Baweary, and consecrated by the papists, before the blessed licht shone upon the kingdom. It was a great hauf, o' oh, Mr. Sulis's on way. There he would sit and consider his sermons, and in dead it's a buildy bit. Well, as he came out of the last end of the Black Hill, I day, he first saw twa, and sin fower, and since seven Corby's craws flying round and round aboon the old kirkyard. They flew lech and heavy, and squawked to other as they guide, and it was clear to Mr. Sois that something had put them frae their ordinar. He wasn't easy flyed, and God strucked up to the was, and wa so they find there but a man, or the appearance of a man, sitting in the inside upon a grave. He was of a great stature, and black as hell, and his een were singular to see. Mr. Sewis had heard tell o' black men. Money's the time, but there was something unco about this black man that daunted him. Het as he was, he took a kind of cold grew in the marrow of his banes, but up he spack for all that, and he says, My friend, are you a stranger in this place? The black man answered never a word. He got upon his feet, and be good to herself on the wa on the far side, but I look at the minister, and the minister stood and look it back, till all oh, in a minute the black man was over the wall and running for the build of the trees. Mr Sulis, he hardly kenned why, ran after him, but it was sair for jasket with his walk, and the het on some weather, and ran as he liked it. He got nae mere than a glisk of the black man among the burks, till he won down to the foot of the hillside, and there he saw him and smear, gone, hap, step, and lipe, our due water to the manse. Mr. Sulis was nae weel pleased at this fearsome gangrel, so Max a free wi' a weary manse, and he ran the harder and wet shoon over the burn and up the walk, but the deal a black man was there to see. He stepped out upon the road, but there was nobody there. He guided all over the garden, but nay, nay, black man. 
at the hinder end, and a bit fear does what is but natural. He lifted the hasp and into the manse, and there was Janet McClower before he's in, we are thrown Craig, and then so pleased to see him. And he eye-minded sin sign when he first set his in upon her, he had the same cold and did he grew. Janet, says he, have you seen a black man? A black man? quoth she. Save us all. You're no wise, minister. There's no black man in all Bawiri. But she didna speak plain, you mun understand, but yam yammered like a pony with a bit in his moo. Well, says he, Janet, if there was nae black man, I have spoken with the accuser of the brethren. And he sat down like any way a fever, and his teeth chittered in his head. Hoots, says she, think shame to yourself, minister, and gied him a drap brandy that she keep die by her. Sign Mr. Sewers gaed into his study among all his boots. It's a lang, lech, murk chalmer, perishing cold in winter, and no very dry, even in the top of the summer, for the man stands near the burn. So Dooney sat, and thought of all that had come and gain since he was in Bawiri, and his hame, and the days when he was a bairn and ran daffin on the braes, and that black man, I ran in his heed like the hour come of a sang. Ay, the Mary thought, the Mary thought to the black man. He tried the prayer, and the words wouldn't come to him, and he tried, they say, to write at his book, but he couldn't make no mere of that. There was whiles he thought the black man was at his oxter, and the swat stood upon him, cold as well water, and there was other whiles when he came to himself, like a christened bairn, and minded nothing. The upshot was that he gied to the window and stood glowering at dual water. The trees are unco thick and the water lies deep and black under the manse and there was Janet washing the clays where coats kilted. She had her back to the minister and he, for his part, hardly kenned what he was looking at. Sign she turned round and showed her face. Mr. Sewis had the same cold grew as twice that day afore and it was borne in upon him what folks said, that Janet was deed lang syne, and this was a boggle in her clay-cold flesh. He drew back a pickle, and he scanned her narrowly. She was tramp, tramping in the clays, crooning to herself, and I, good guide us, but it was a fearsome face, while she sang louder, but there was nae man born a woman that could tell the words o' her sang, and while she looked at side lang doon, but there was nothing there for her to look at. There gave her a scunner through the flesh upon his banes, and that was Heaven's advertisement. But Mr. Sewis just blamed himself. He said to think ill of a poor old afflicted wife that hadn't a friend for by himself, and he put up a prayer for him and her, and drank a little collar water, for his heart rose again, the meat, and gave up to his naked bed in the gloaming. That was a nicht that has never been forgotten in Bawiri, the nicht of the 17th of August, 1712. It had been het afore, as I has said, but that nicht it was heter than ever. The sun gaed down among uncold looking clouds, it fell as a murk as the pit, no a star, no a breath o' wind, you couldn't see your horn afore your face, and even the old folk coosed the covers for their beds, and lay pecking for their breath. With all that he had upon his mind, it was gay and unlikely Mr. Sewis would get muckle sleep. He lay and he tumbled. The good collar bed that he got into brunt his very banes whiles he slept and whiles he wakened, whiles he heard the time o' nicht and whiles a tyke yowling up the muir as if somebody was dead. Whiles he thought they heard bogles clavering in his lug, and whiles he saw spunkies in the room, he behooved, he judged to be sick, and sick he was. Little he jaloosed the sickness. At the hinder end, he got a clearness in his mind, sat up in his sack on the bedside, and fell thinking ain't smear o' the black man and Janet. He couldn't weel tell how. Maybe it was the cold to his feet, but it came in upon him with a spate that there was some connection between their twa, and that either, or both of them, were bogles. 
and just at that moment, in Janet's room, which was nice to his, there came a stamp of feet as if men were warshling and then a loud bang. And then a wand gave the Reichlin round the fower quarters of the house. And then all was once mere sealant as the grave. Mr. Sewis was feared for neither man nor devil. He got his tinder box and lit a candle and made three steps of it over to Janet's door. It was on the hasp and he pushed it open and kicked boldly in. It was a big room, as big as the minister's ain, and plenished with a grand old solid gear for he had nothing else. There was a flower poster bed with old tapestry and a broad cabinet of ache that was full of the minister's divinity books and put there to be out of the gate and a wee dudge of Janet's lying here and there about the floor. But nay, Janet could Mr. Sewa see, nor ony sign of a contention. And he gaed, and there's few that would have followed him, and look it all round and listened. But there was nothing to be heard neither inside the manse, nor in all Bawiri parish, and nothing to be seen but the muckle shadows turning round the canal. And then, all at ends, the minister's heart played dunt and stood stock still, and a cold wind blew among the hairs of his head. What an a weary sicht was that for the poor man's in, for there was Janet hanging free a nail beside the old ache cabinet, her head eye lay in her shither, her een were steeked, the tongue projected fra her mouth, and her heels were twa feet clear upon the floor. God forgive us all, thought the Mr. Sewis. Poor Janet's dead. He came a step nearer to the corp, and then his heart fair whammled in his inside, for, by what cantrip it would all beseem a man to judge, she was hanging free a single nail, and by a single worsted thread for darning hose. It's an awful thing to be alone at night with sick and prodigies of darkness, but Mr. Sewis was strong in the Lord. He turned and gied his ways out of that room and locked at the door ahint him, and step by step down the stairs as heavy as lead, and set down the candle on the table at the stair foot. He couldna pray, he couldna think, he was dreeping with cold swat, and nothing could he hear but the dunt, dunt, dunt in his ain heart. He might maybe have stood there an hour, or maybe twa, he minded so little, when all of a sudden he heard a lech, uncanny steer upstairs, a foot gaed to and fro in the chamber where the corp was hanging. Soon the door was opened, though he minded well that he had locked it, and soon there was a step upon the landing, and it seemed to him as if the corp was looking over the tail and doing upon him where he stood. He took up the cannel again, for he couldn't want the licht, and... As saftly as ever he could, gaed struck to the manse and to the far end of the causeway. It was I picked Mark, the flame of the candle, and when he set it on the ground, brunt, steady and clear as in a room, Nathan moved. But the dual water seeping and sabbing down the glen, and yon unhaly footstep that come plodding down the stairs inside the manse, he kenned the foot of our wheel, for it was Janet's. And at Ilka step, that came a wee thing nearer, the cold got deeper in his vitals. He commended his soul to him that made, and keep at him. And, O oh Lord, said he, give me strength, that this night to war against the powers of evil. By this time the foot was coming through the passage for the door. He could hear a hand skirt along the wall, as if the fearsome thing was feeling for its way. The socks tossed and maned together. A long sigh came over the hills. The flame of the cannon was blown about, and there stood the corp of Thrawn Janet, with her grogram goon and her black much, with the heed eye upon the shooter and the gurn still upon the face of it. Leaving, you would have said, deed, as Mr. Sewis well kenned, upon the threshold of the manse. It's a strange thing that the sorrow man should be thrilled into his perishable body, but the minister saw that, and his heart didn't break. She didn't stand there lying. She began to move again, and came slowly toward Mr. Sewis, where he stood under the socks. All the life of his body, 
Oh, the strength of his spirit were glowering for his een. It seemed she was gone to speak, but wanted words, and made a sign with a left hand. There cam a clap o' wind, like a cat's fuff. Out gaed the canal. The saws screeched like folk, and Mr. Sewell's ken that live or die. This was the end o' it. Witch! Beldam! Devil! he cried. I charge you by the power of God be gone. If you be dead, to the grave. If you be damned, to hell. And at that moment the Lord's ain hand out of the heavens struck the horror where it stood, the old, dead, desecrated corp of the witchwife, say lang keep it for the grave, and her cell drowned by deals, loud up like a bronze-stained spunk and fell in ashes to the ground. The thunder followed. Peel and dull and peel, the rain and rain upon the back o' that, and Mr. Sewers louped through the garden hedge, and ran with skellock upon skellock for the clacking. That same morning, John Christie saw the black man pass the muckle cairn as it was chapping six, before eight, he gaed by the change house at Knockdo, and no long after, Sandy McClellan saw him gone linking down the braes for kill McCurley. There's little doubt, but it was him that dwelled so lang in Janet's body. But he was a wat last, and since sign the deal has never fashed as in Baweary. But it was a sad dispensation for the minister. Lang, lang he lay raving in his bed, and fra that hour to this, he was the man ye ken the day. <laughs>